Well, shalomi homies. I hope you guys are doing absolutely marvelous. Today, we are going to jump back in for another episode of the War of the Ages. You know what today we're going to jump into? We're going to talk about Daniel fighting dragons. Yes. Because as we've been going along in this series, we've talked a lot about that kind of war between immortals, right? And those ultimate showdowns and fiery showdowns. Well, tonight I'm going to read from you guys a little bit more of the story of Daniel. Now, if you go back just about 180 years, we've talked about this quite a bit here, but our scriptures that we used to have, the collections of sacred texts that we used to hold dear, were augmented tremendously. And the preeminent place in which they were done is they ripped out a section that they had titled the Apocrypha. Now, in there is all kinds of texts that are incredibly valuable and had been utilized by people for centuries, millennia, really, to get a better assertion and understanding of how the world actually functions and encapsulated hiding inside those texts really is an explanation behind some of the characters that we get in the scriptures that we inherited today that's very helpful to understand where they came from. Like, why was Daniel revered? Why was Daniel selected to be, at the very beginning of Daniel 1, we get this story about him and three other individuals as these young men who are selected by the very kind of talent scouts of Nebuchadnezzar to be brought into the temple. And they're like, you know, these guys deserve special training, you know, but what is it that made Daniel first and foremost rise to a place of understanding or accolades amongst the people? And this is very important kind of stuff because there are these showdowns that happen historically and that a lot of these histories get mythologized later on. Like, why are there so many tales of people fighting dragons? Like really actually fighting dragons because modern day history has tried to collectively expunge from the record the reality that dragons live with people contemporaneous still do they just they really are uncomfortable with that they don't want anybody getting an idea of that oh my thank you naomi she's brought me a snack thank you she likes to make all kinds of little morsels in the afternoon and, and uh this one looks good Bean seeds scrumptiousness Praise Yah for daughters. Oh, I'm very thankful to have my daughter be old enough to make snacks for me. That's such a good feeling. I love food. I love when people give me gifts in particular. And my daughter gives me many, many good gifts. And now she likes to make food. It's really cool to get to see her change and develop and like what her aptitudes are. And she loves being like a mom. It's so cute. It's awesome. She's great. Hey, there's some good rewards from raising children. It's brutal. You guys can go back to the just, if you want to watch me go on absolute tyrannically terrified rants about what life was like not too long ago, this was the craziest year of our life. But I'm a lot more transparently raw because I'm running on a couple hours of sleep throughout like, I don't know, the first seven months of the last year. But I talked about just losing my literal mind trying to raise these twins. Oh my God. It almost killed us. I am telling you, savage. I enjoy the babies and stuff now because they have personalities. I learned something. I'll get back to Daniel, I promise, but this is really important. I learned something about the differences between men and women that is very helpful for me mentally to understand why I have such an easier time enjoying children, my children, after they're not a baby. I know I'm going to sound like a really bad dad for a second, but I just, babies are awfully difficult. Two babies. Let me put it that way, too. Dualies was a nightmare. I love all you parents that had good, easy babies. Congratulations. You are the minority. But babies, like infants, are absolutely brutal. So it's a miracle that they suddenly develop a personality. And then they're just so much more fun. You know what I'm saying? And I, I found out something about the way that men and women are wired differently. We make oxytocin, right? They call this the love drug. And this is like the thing that makes you feel lovey-dovey. And it's like what helps to bond us to people. This is something that's very important for relationships. Now, women release the most amount of this oxytocin when they're nurturing their children, when they're like meeting their needs. This is why the Proverbs 31 women, if you read about the descriptions about what makes a woman so precious more valuable than rubies my my girls are all memorizing proverbs 31 right now and they're doing like actions for it as they go along which is super cute but they're uh they're so they're saying it because they're trying to learn like what is an actual woman that should be exalted and honored because our society doesn't want to honor women that look like this or act like this or are this because they are absolutely super weapons you know what i'm saying they're like literally the most dangerous things on the earth is women that are like this. And that's because they were literally made women. You were made 
girls, young girls, listen, you were made to nurture. You were. It is. That's when you release it the most. Like a mom, when she's breastfeeding her baby, it's the highest possible amounts of oxytocin release. When she's feeding them, clothing them, providing for them, nourishing them, snuggling them, being close to them, that's when she's like, oxytocin just goes through the roof. Whereas dads, it's when we're playing with our children. That's when we release the most oxytocin. Like I like to throw my children into the air as high as I possibly can. Like I love to vault them as close as I can to the ceiling and just watch their faces as they're like, oh. I just think it's hysterical. They love it. And all, not all the time, but sometimes they really dig it. I have half of my children love it. The other half is genuinely terrified and it's just hysterical to watch. But it's like when you're wrestling and playing like that is when men release the highest amount of oxytocin. So it, fi it finally gave me like an understanding as to why I struggled so much with appreciating my children, my, my babies until they like had personalities and they're like, oh, they're interact. I like I can interact with them. They, they laugh, they smile, that kind of stuff, you know. It helped me to know that. But like when you read the Proverbs 31 woman here, let's check this out. This is what she says about her. Let's highlight her before we go to Susanna, which is the book that we're going to read from next, which is the origin story of Daniel. If anybody ever actually chronicled the awesomeness of the scriptures in theatrical form, the book of Susanna would be the like the origin story of Daniel before Belteshazzar, before all of these like showdown crazy moments that happen later on in life take place. The book of Susanna is where we're going. But let's get a, another understanding of who the Proverbs 31 woman is because Susanna, the, the main character in that book, She's embodying so much of this. Ready for this? The words of Sovereign Lemuel, a message which his mother taught him. What, my chosen? And what, chosen of my womb? And what, chosen of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to wiping away sovereigns. Not for sovereigns, O Lemuel, not for sovereigns to drink strong drink nor for princes to desire strong drink, excuse me, not for sovereigns to drink wine, nor for princes to drink st strong drink, lest they drink and forget what is inscribed and pervert the right of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those embittered in being. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the dumb. In the case of all the sons of the departed, open your mouth, judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and the needy. So these are like the queen's instructions, the, mo the mother of the king's instructions to her son. She's like, you're going to be a king now. There's some different standards of living that should apply to you. Hey, those of you that are like followers of the remnant in the way, consider this. Yahuwah's design and original intent for us was to be kings and queens. Like that's what we were made to be, priests and kings. So these standards should be applicable towards you. Something to consider about your life. And you can, it's very beneficial words right here. Words to live by. Now, this is the wife. Who does find a capable wife? For she is worth far more than rubies. The heart of her husband shall trust in her and he has no lack of gain. She shall do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She shall seek wool and flax. And with delights, she works with her hands. She shall be as the ships of the merchant. She brings in her food from afar. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household and what is lawful for her girls. She shall consider a field and buy it. From her profit, she shall plant a vineyard. She shall gird herself with strength and strengthen her arms. She shall taste when her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out by night. She shall stretch out her hands to the distaff, and her hand shall hold the spindle. She shall extend her hand to the poor, and shall reach out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household is dressed in scarlet. She shall make tapestry for herself. She's dressed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She shall make fine linen and sell them, and shall give girdles for the merchants. Strength and splendor are her garments, and she rejoices in time to come. She shall open her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the Torah of loving commitment. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children shall rise up and call her blessed. 
my husband too, and he praises her. Many daughters have done nobly, but you have risen above them all. Loveliness is deceptive. Vanity is deceptive, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears Yahuwah is to be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. You young, young ladies who are out there, listen. There is an embodiment of wisdom that is hiding here in the scriptures about who your identity was made to be. Whether you had a father who raised you up with the right attributes of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, a man who revered Yahuwah and showed you this is what you should be looking for in a husband. Understand, you can rise to a standard that is excellent, and you should. You ought to. You have a duty to yourself and also for the children that should one day come from your womb because the gift that you can give them is the blessing of guarding yourself until the time and the choosing of you being emplaced into the trust of a righteous man. It is a great honor and a blessing for a man to find a woman who regards this word as the guidelines for her life that's saturated in it, that's moving and understanding in the wisdom and the spirit of Elohim. She's so valuable and so rare and understand becoming more rare every single day. And you know what? This world will do everything it can to destroy from you the true idea of what femininity looks like. But you know what? Look and exemplify. It talks about later on in Timothy and Titus about these other character attributes that we should be looking for in our women and the wives and in, in our wife. And like, there's these beautiful instructions for how older women should help to instruct and raise up mentor younger women. And listen, if you don't have that in your life right now, you can find it here in the scriptures. You can find it in the wisdom of the word and it can transform you and make you a better person. One that is truly rare because you know what? The world is full of people masquerading girls, masquerading as women, thinking that they have picked up a strong torch of liberty and freedom and self-sovereignty. And they picked up the chains of bondage because the ways of the world are contrary absolutely adversarial to all the ways of wisdom. Now, listen, we're going to read from the book of Susanna here so you can get an idea of just what type of women should be exonerated and lifted up. And we're going to see those absolutely reprobate types of men that are in positions of authority, manipulating others around them to pervert right ruling. Okay, we're going to go back in time to the days when Israel, the house of Israel has been scattered across the world, right? They have been given over to the king of Sennacherib. We read about that last week in 2 Kings. They are scattered and, and lost. Well, the, the kingdom of Judah is also now taken captive and taken back to Babylon. And so this story is going to pick up kind of back in that time range where Daniel is a young man, an unknown character for lack of, lack of descriptions. So I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to let you guys read along with me here. This is uh, one of the websites that I utilize. Let's go to... So this is Safaria, safaria.org, and they've got all kinds of different texts on here as well, and they have parallel scriptures. So those of you that are looking at the Hebrew, this is one of the precious things. Look at this. Oh, it's not covered with all these additions of man with the vowel markers and stuff. What a blessing. Oh, it's just less chaotic, and it's like true to form of the word. It's very helpful. Anyways, let's jump in here. This is the book of Susanna, chapter 1. There was a man in the city of Babylon, and his name was Jehoiakim. He took for himself a woman, Susanna, the daughter of Hilkiah, and she was beautiful and feared Elohim, because her parents were righteous and directed her in the paths of the Torah of Moses. Come on now. There's your like deep desire, parents. Come on. Oh, this is how you raise up a righteous woman. Jehoiakim was very rich, and he had a desirable garden by his house, and everyone gathered unto him because he was the most respected of the men of the city. In that year, two elders of the city became judges of the nation. They were among the men about whom Yahuwah had said, From Babylon there went out wickedness, and from her elders the judges of the nation. They came out every day to Jehoiakim's house, and if a person had a concern, he would come to them. In the afternoons, when every person had gone his way, Susanna would go to swim in her husband's garden. The elders saw the woman walking every day in the garden, and they lusted. Their hearts were turned, and instead of turning their eyes to heaven, 
they turned their eyes toward her, and they did not remember the Torah of Yahuwah or his judgments. Even though both were overcome with passion, the elders did not reveal their love to each other because they were embarrassed. This is a parallel to contrast. If you've read from the book of Jasher, or even also the book of Jubilees, it describes when Joseph is getting tempted by Potiphar's wife. And this went on for a long time, like many days, I believe like full year, that she was nonstop trying to find ways to seduce him. It said that he would look upon the ground rather than to look upon her because the way she was dressing to incite lust, right? Beautifying of her eyes, vanity. She's, she was like Jezebel embodied. But he would look upon the ground rather than to look upon her. It was a beautiful thing. Whereas we see the contrast to the men that do not divert their gaze. Every day they rushed to the door of the garden to see her. The elders said to each other, Let us return to our houses because it's near time for lunch. After they went, and after the elders separated from one another, each one turned back and returned to the garden and found themselves together. And when one questioned the other, saying, What is the meaning of this? They confessed their evil desire, and they took counsel together and set a time to ambush her when she was by herself. On that day, they were lying in wait, and Susanna came, as she was accustomed, to wash in the garden during the heat of the day. With her were two handmaidens, and there was no man in the vineyard other than the two old men who hid to ambush her. And Susanna said to her daughters, Buy me oil and a pitcher, and shut the vineyard until I am washed. And the girls would do as she requested, and close the door in her flock. And they did not see the men, because they were hiding. The two men came out of the hiding place and ran over Shoshana and said, Behold, the vineyard is locked, and there is no one here to see. Our soul desires you, so let us come and come to you. And if you will not listen to us, we will testify that we have seen a man with you in the vineyard, and therefore you sent the girls from you. And Shoshana sighed and said to him, Because I am narrow and clenched, if I do what they want, I am the daughter of my own death. If I cease, who will save me from their hand? It is a good thing for me to fall into the cleanliness as in the hands of a man who sins to Elohim. And Shoshana raised her voice and cried out, and the old man shouted at her. And the one ran to the door and opened it. And the people of the house heard her cry and ran to the vineyard to see what she was doing. And when the men brought forth their evil report against her, the maidservants were ashamed for such a thing had not been heard since the day of her birth. And the next day, when the people were gathered together at the house, Jehoiakim, her husband, and the two elders also came and brought upon her false charges, so that they will sentence her to death. And they said to the people, Send for Susanna, the daughter of Hilkiah, the wife of Jehoiakim, to come to us. And they sent for her to bring her, and she came with her parents, her children, and all her family. And Shoshana was a beautiful appearance, soft and delightful. And the wicked men commanded to remove the veil from her face so that they might enjoy her beauty. And all her acquaintances and those who stood by her wept with great weeping. And the two elders arose and stood among the people, and they placed their hands upon the head of Shoshana. She wept bitterly with a heavy heart and lifted her eyes to the sky, for her heart trusted in Elohim. And the elders responded and said, Behold, both of us were walking in the vineyard, and Shoshana came in with her two maids. And afterward she sent her maids away from her, and she locked up the vineyard. And a young man who was hidden in the garden approached her and lay with her. And when we saw this wickedness in the corner of the garden, we approached her and saw that she was lying with him. However, we were not able to seize the young man, for he was stronger than us, and he opened the door and fled. And when we restrained her and asked her, Who is this young man? She refused to answer anything. Now we are witnesses to this matter. And the people believed in the words of the elders, and the judges judged her with the death penalty. And Shoshana cried out in her distress and said, Adonai, our Adonai, our Yahuwah, all mysteries and hidden things are revealed to you, and you know them before they came to be. You also know there's no truth in their mouths and that they testify falsely against me. And now behold, I'm going to die, though I have done nothing that these wicked men have charged me with in their malicious hearts. And Elohim heard her cry, and he showed favor, grace to her. 
she was about to die. But Elohim raised up the spirit of a young boy named Daniel. And he spoke up and said, I am innocent of the blood that will be shed. And all the people turned and asked him, What is this thing you've spoken? And Daniel took his stand among the people and said, Listen now, Israelites, you've acted foolishly in bringing charges against an Israelite woman without investigating and studying the matter before. Return now to the court and see that these men have lied about her. And all the people hurried back to the court and they judged her innocent. And the elder said to Daniel, Please sit with us and let us discern if Elohim has appointed you as a man of judgment and justice. And Daniel answered and said, Let the two witnesses be separated from each other, and I will question each man individually. And after they had parted, he called the first elder and said to him, The elders in the days and in crimes now will lay his hands on your head. Please know that you have judged unfairly, justifying the wicked and condemning the righteous, even though Elohim has said, Do not kill the innocent with the righteous. Now, if you have seen what you spoke of, tell me the name of the tree under which you found them. And he answered, Under a terebinth tree. And Daniel said, May Elohim judge you and curse you, and may he command his angels to cut you off. And he sent him away. He commanded to bring the second, and he said to him, You are a son of Canaan and not a, of Yahuda. Indeed, the beauty of the woman has seduced you, and the spirit of promiscuity has changed your heart. Thus, this is what your deeds have been all along, to prostitute the daughters of Israel, and by their fear you have bent them to fulfill your every desire. Except for this daughter of Judah, who did not listen to your voice of prostitution. And now tell me the name of the tree under which you saw, under which you found them. And he answered and said to them, Under an oak tree. And Daniel said, May falsehood cover your face in disgrace. See, the angel of Yahuwah is waving his sword over you to destroy you. And the people heard and lifted up their voices to give thanks to Elohim, the Savior of all those who hope for his kindness. And all of them rose up against the elders who had been caught by the sayings of their mouths, by the hand of Daniel, for they had testified falsely against Susanna. And they did to them according to the law of Moses. And you shall do to him as he had intended to do to his brother. And they killed them. And they were saved on that day from shedding innocent blood in Israel. And Hilkiah and his wife gave praise and glory to Elohim for the matter of their daughter, for no shameful thing was found in her. And so her husband, Jehoiakim, and his entire family did too. And Daniel became great and esteemed in the eyes of the people from that day forward until the day of his death. Isn't that just marvelous? This is what happens when you raise your young boys up to be sons of righteousness. They can guard and preserve the life of innocent people around them. You see that spirit of Elohim came upon Daniel, right? This is one of the most beautiful things when you're reading through, especially in the Old Testament, when you see this moment come upon somebody. You see this with Samson, right? You see this with Gideon. You'll see this, especially in the book of Judges. It has so many of these stories where you'll see the spirit of Elohim come upon them. It's this incredible moment that the vessel is finally filled with the wind that it needs to sing the song of life. And it's such a powerful moment. If you've not seen somebody who's a master musician, pick up an instrument and play. You've not ever really witnessed the beauty of the expression of, of life filling the empty void of nothingness. But Daniel is suddenly filled with that spirit and boldness. The absolute thing that you see with the Holy Spirit, this the Ruach HaKodesh, when that spirit comes upon them, the single greatest fruit of the spirit's activity in our life is boldness, boldness and courage. These are like the defining characteristics of true wisdom is knowing how to apply it and ways to apply it properly. And this is the beauty of what you see. It's, it reminds me, let's go over to another guy who did this in a moment. 
He didn't pick up the spear. Daniel didn't, but he rose up amidst the congregation. Anytime I see that, anytime you see some man standing up in the midst of an assembly, or even like when we read about Deborah rising up from the midst, the children of Israel as the prophetess, right? Prophesying under those palm trees. When people are rising up from amidst the congregation or the assembly, this is, this should always draw your attention to the desire for Yahweh to have his children be set apart. This is like as any parent would hope that their son or their daughter would actually exemplify this in the day of their testing, in their seasons of testing. And the reason why we as parents ought to do our absolute utmost to guard them from being fed to the den of lions too soon. Many parents are like have this mentality or this justification for when they send their children to public school saying like, oh, I've raised them up, you know, for their early years in life and in good schooling. And I just kind of, we got to let them experience what the world is like. And so they can stand up under it. Listen, like John Taylor Gatto in his book, for just how long it takes to crack a child. I know I read this entire chapter not too long ago. If you guys want to go back and listen to the, the entirety of this I listen Gaza chapter. He says it's three year process. Any child to get once they get in there. It's horrible. But it's designed to be this way. This is on page 106. He says the decisive dynamics which make forced schooling poisonous to healthy human development aren't hard to spot. Work in classrooms isn't significant work. It fails to satisfy real needs pressing on the individual. It doesn't answer real questions experience raises in the young mind. It doesn't contribute to solving any problem encountered in actual life. The net effect of making all schoolwork external to individuals' longings, experience, questions, and problems is to render the victim listless. This phenomenon has been well understood at least since the time of the British enclosure enclosure movement, which forced small farmers off their land into factory work. Growth and mastery came only to those who vigorously self-direct, initiating, creating, doing, reflecting, freely associating, enjoying privacy. These are precisely what the structures of schooling are set up to prevent on one pretext or another. As I watched it happen, it took about three years to break most kids. Three years confined to environments of emotional neediness with nothing real to do. In such environments, songs, smiles, bright colors, cooperative games, and other tension breakers do the work better than angry words and punishment. Years ago, it struck me as a little more than odd that the Prussian government was the patron of Heinrich Pestalozzi, inventor of multicultural fun and games, psychological elementary schooling, and of Friedrich Froebel, inventor of kindergarten. It struck me as odd that J.P. Morgan's partner, Peabody, was instrumental in bringing Rush Prussian schooling to the prostrate South after the Civil War. But after a while, I began to see that behind the philanthropy lurked a rational economic purpose. The strong meshes of the school net are invisible. Constantly bidding for a stranger's attention creates a chemistry producing the common characteristics of the modern school children. Whining, dishonesty, malice, treachery, cruelty, unceasing competition for official favor in the dramatic fishbowl of a little classroom delivers cowardly children, little people sunk in chronic boredom, little people with no apparent purpose for being alive. The full significance of the classroom as a dramatic environment, as primarily a dramatic environment, has never been properly acknowledged or examined. The most destructive dynamic is identical to that which causes caged rats to develop eccentric or even violent mannerisms when they press a bar for sustenance on an aperiodic reinforcement schedule, one where food is delivered at random, but the rat doesn't suspect. Much of the weird behavior school kids display is a function of the aperiodic reinforcement schedule and the endless confinement and inactivity to slowly drive children out of their minds. Trapped children, like trapped rats, need close management, and any rat psychologist will tell you that. They designed a system in compulsory education classrooms to behaviorally modify children like animals. That is what it's based off of. They are creating an environment that is going to ruin 
your child. It's a guarantee. That's what it was made to do. And people have invested now hundreds of billions of dollars into a system to destroy your son and your daughter from ever being truly a bold and courageous warrior for the kingdom of righteousness, including many private schooling systems, even Christian faith-based ones. Listen, they are not designed to imitate the way of raising up your children according to the scriptures. Mothers and fathers, we were designed to have our children with us, with us. Listen, this was the way it had been forever. It's only in this version of modernity that we experience today where children are are kept compartmentalized. Age, you got people taking children and separating them from their peers of different ages. And so by design, like when you step your child into a fifth grade classroom, and if they started that year and they're a little bit young for being able to go in, but they have other children that are much older that are going in, you just create this absolute wolf-like environment where a child that's a bigger, smarter, and more intelligent, more capable, more rich, more powerful, more influential, all these different microcosms get meshed up in the kingdom of the fourth graders, right? Or the fifth graders. Whereas if you had classrooms where there's a school of instruction of a variety of ages, you're able to have children that have wisdom that are older, more responsible, that are young men and young women help to maintain structure and it allows everything to function much more smoothly. But as soon as you rip that out of that system, it's incredibly destructive because now it's just the kingdom of social Darwinianism evolution just evolving in front of your face on this microcosm. It's an absolute nightmare. And listen, I went to so many different schools throughout my life. I saw very different versions of this from very expensive private Christian schools all the way down to the very budget public schools and everywhere in between and including homeschooling. And you know what? The benefit that happens is I am I am able to get to see and interact with children now who are being raised outside of the system. Hallelujah. So many parents were finally shaken awake to get their children out of the system of schooling, especially back during 2019 and 2020. And this is one of the greatest things that could ever happen. I could not be more grateful that colleges are starting to mandate things that people are like, I refuse to let my children be forced into that. I mean, the best thing you can ever do is not convince your children they need to go to college. They don't need to go to college. It's even worse in college because now you're giving them carte blanche in how they raise their time with a bunch of idiots. Like the vast majority of every single person that going to a college now is getting trained into even further illiteracy and to be burdened with the bondage of debt on a scale that has never before been seen. Like I had peers that are just now getting into the working side of their life who have $700,000 of student loans, $700,000 of student loans. Now they might make six figures, but the reality is they are going to end up paying a million and a half dollars on that by the time they get it paid off. It's an unbelievable death trap. This is why the borrower is slave to the lender in a serious way. Student loans are the most destructive version of that. To me, these are literally the forms of Egypt living over us, the spirit of Egypt that we live in today. It's the bondage, forcing children into this this bondage. You you crack them, you shatter their identity, and you keep them from becoming warriors. You know, like when you go back into numbers, let me show you a real warrior of a son. This is what you want in your son. You know what I'm saying? Come on now. This is uh, Numbers 22 through 25. It's one of my favorite chapters, sections in the entire scriptures. Gosh, because Balaam, man, stinking Balaam. Hallelujah, the day that man died. It was notable. Book of Joshua, you guys. Praise Yah. Bad dude. So this is where we get the doctrines of Balaam that show up lots and lots of times. This is one of the most critical understandings of the priest class of sorcerers that are behind the scenes and how they work. They work to get you, us, the remnant, the people of Yahuwah, to sin, to transgress, to break the commandments of Yah so that the immortals have legal grounds to execute their plans of judgment, destruction, death suffering, torture against you. They need legal rights to do that. That's part of the covenant we're in. When we're in a covenant, we are under the covenant of Yahuwah through the blood of the lamb, through his son, Yeshua. When we step outside of that, we are breaking down that hedge of protection. And because of that, the enemy can come in and cause great chaos. Balaam was hired by the king of Moab to curse Israel. 
and he could not do it. But Locke hired him. He's like, I can't curse anyone that Yahuwah has blessed, and Yahuwah has blessed these people. So he came up with a strategy to commit, convince the Israelites to go after committing fornication and eating food sacrifice to other idols and yoking themselves to the daughters of Moab. They, they dressed their daughters up beautifully and had the men of Israel walk out in front of their tents. They're like, hey, you want to be with her? They're like, come on inside and eat with us. And then they are eating to these, these animals a lot of times that are sacrificed to these other mighty ones. They strangle them. The reason, like it says in Acts 15, he's like, hey, don't don't eat food, animals that died through strangulation. That's because a lot of times they would do that so that the blood would be preserved in the animals, a way of not having to cut their throats, right? That's a way of keeping the blood in the meat tissue. So, hey, when you eat fish that are suffocated to death, as opposed to having their, their veins cut, you can cut a fish's veins in their gills and drain the blood out of them also along their the back of their tail area. You can cut all of those and it drains the blood out of it. It will not have a fishy smell for days, sometimes weeks, if you actually drain the blood out of it instead of letting it suffocate and die with all the blood inside of it. Something to consider, you guys. It's called ikijime. It's like a traditional Japanese method of killing the fish. I do a lot of spear fishing, and that's my absolute perfected way of killing a fish. You stab it in the brain, brain dead it. Then you cut the gills, let it drain out all of its blood. So much better. The meat is so much better tasting. It's incredible. Something to consider, you guys. Anyways, the Israelites are being led astray into committing all these horrible acts. And this is what's happening. And Yisrael dwelt in Shittim, and the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. And they invited the people to the slaughterings of their mighty ones. And the people ate and bowed down to their mighty ones. Thus Yisrael was joined to Baal Peor. This is the God of many holes. Lots of disgusting stuff happening here. And then the displeasure of Yahuwah burned against Yisrael. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, Take all the leaders of the people and hang them up before Yahuwah, before the sun, so that the burning displeasure of Yahuwah turns away from Yisrael. And Moshe said to the judges of Yisrael, Each one of you kill his men who were joined to Baal Peor. And see, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brothers a Midianite woman before the eyes of Moshe, before the eyes of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping at the door of the tent of appointment. And when Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aharon, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a spear in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague among the children of Israel came to a stop, and those who died in the plague were 24,000. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aharon the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was ardent with my ardor, zealous with my zealousness in their midst, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zealousness. Therefore say, see, I am giving my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his seed after him a covenant of everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his Elohim, and made atonement for the children of Israel. And the name of the man of Israel who was struck, who was struck with the Midianite woman, was Zimri, son of Salu, a leader of a father's house among the Shimonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was struck was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, he was head of the people of the father's house in Midian. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Distress the Midianites, and you shall strike them, for they distressed you with their tricks, with which they deceived you in the matter of Peor, and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the leader of Midian, their sister, who was struck in the day of the plague because of Peor. Phineach, Phineas. Man, that's the goal for our sons, to be zealous like he was. Just a beautiful blessing to have a child that's zealous for the ways of Yahuwah. It gives you peace of mind because I understand the greatest gift any of you can have is understanding the world through a biblical lens view, is having the morality, the cloak of morality covering you and shielding you and insulating you. There is a reason our country used to be a place where there was a general accepted safety. When people walked down the roads, children played outside. Some of you that are watching this that are in your 60s or 70s or 80s, you understand and you can can recall a generation when there was peace in the land. There wasn't this dreadful feeling of danger, of predators lurking around. Like just, it's still that the memories of that are still visceral 
for some of us. And you know what? There's others who are being raised in, in this time, in this generation, without ever of having that experience of being able to go down and walk to a store, walk to school on your own for miles. You know, that these experiences that some of us took for granted. I didn't think anything of it when I was six years old, walking to school with my sisters. I didn't think anything of it as peculiar or strange or potentially dangerous, you know, but the days of that have changed in so many ways. And we're watching around us the moral fibers of this country burn because they've been infected with these doctrines of Balaam. Listen, the plumed serpent, these immortals have come into this nation and the priests behind them have instituted a form of eradication of everything related to reading and understanding, comprehending and implementing the wisdom that is found from this book. They have made it their enemy number one. You think that just because on the TV they say this is the FBI's most wanted list, these are the things we're going after more. The real terrorism that they're going after, the real agenda behind a war on terror, a war against an invisible enemy, the war against speech, this is ultimately the goal. The goal is to eradicate this from people's hearts. They don't want anybody to be guided and directed by that because that's what made Thinea mis absolutely lethal. That's what made Daniel lethal is that he was raised up. Susanna was raised up on, in understanding and righteousness and was raised by the Torah of Yahuwah. And you know what? That's why there's been such a calculated agenda to dispensationalize us from any understanding of history through the Old Testament, that we would not even have a basic comprehension of what the Old Testament had to do with, what anything was happening through a Hebraic worldview. This is why they they focus so heavily on the Greek side of the equation and the Roman side of the equation, neglecting entirely the realities of our Hebraic history. They don't want us to have any understanding with that because it's a power bank. It's a power bank of contextual wisdom that we can't have if we just rip out the pages from it. Like I had a pastor. I'm going to rant. Hang on for a second. Okay. Talk about two separate things here real quick. I had a pastor. I promise we're going to get to Daniel fighting the dragon for you young warriors that are just so zealous and excited to get there. Hey, I have a question for you. Do you have a sword and a spear? I mean, we've read so far about a spear. Just saying, this is why I have spears. Literally because of Phineas. I'm like, someday I want to be Phineas. I want to be like Phineas. Please, Yahuwah, let me rise up from the congregation with the spear in my hand. Let me be like that. You know what? I've had some opportunities to do that. I didn't have a spear in my hand, but I had a sword in my mouth. I'll tell you that much. Absolute perversion in the house of Yahuwah. Conspiracy of silence. Perverts still ruling and reigning in the disgusting fellowships abounding. Oh my gosh. For another day. But... This is from Michael Lake's book. He has a great perspective that's given in this. This is a, I know we've been reading previously from the Shinar Directive and the Sharif Imperative, but this is his other one that's in the series called The Kingdom Priesthood by Dr. Michael Lake. Forgive my finger. I was showing Naomi how to use a magnesium fire starter and I literally carved a gigantic chunk of flesh out of my knuckle. It was bad. It was bad. Live dangerously. Carefully, but live dangerously. Anyways, he starts out this book with something called... This is fantastic. He's just such a brilliant writer. And he uh, illustrates this so much about the doctrines of dispensationalism. See, because we went to this church at the, about the exact same time I started reading the Shinar Directive and listening to Dr. Michael Lake and Mary Lou and uh, their Kingdom Intelligence Briefing podcasts. Right about the same time as that, we started going to a small church that was in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Anyways. What we didn't know when we walked in there, they had some they had some of the most wonderful, friendly, loving people that we'd ever met at a church. They were fantastic people. At the same time, we were really radically moving away from modern Christianity. My wife and I were part of the churchianity of uh, Flatirons Community Church out in Lafayette, Colorado. I love you Coloradans that are still there fighting the good fight. Hold the line. Anyways, this place had uh, given itself over to money laundering for the elite and just compromised itself drastically in order to uh, fill its coffers. So we watched them just water themselves down and water the word down with it until it became unpalatable because the salt had lost its savor. And so we left it. And uh, then we ended up going to a few different other little churches trying it out. But then we stumbled on this little place that they were huge pro-lifers, pro-personhood. They, they were very, very big apologetics 
folks that were training and training their congregation on how to defend their faith. Brilliant people, incredibly savvy. And they had a love for the unborn, the children that were being massacred and murdered at Denver's infanticide center, the house of Moloch, where children are slaughtered and sacrificed on the altar of pride. Literally, they had in their windows gigantic letters proud on their uh, ziggurat. Their, their, their temple literally looked like a ziggurat, like a Babylonian ziggurat. It's a freak show place. Denver uh, abortion center, a surgical center. Anyways, this this church and the members of it, a lot of the folks, they went every single day to try to rescue babies. They're incredible people. And uh, and for that, I was like, this is great. It's just so good to hear people like preaching a salty gospel and they were active with their love of the kingdom and their works. Like when we went down there, we saw cars with the Flatirons Community Church bumper sticker driving in there, women going in there to murder their children, literally from the church that we were attending previously. It was a very brutal like wake up call. But as we were going there, I started like, you know, getting to know the leadership and, and, uh, the pastor was like wanting to spend more time with me. So he sat me down and was like, let's go over, let's go over the scriptures. And I'm like, yes, let's do it. So he came over to my house and he sat down with me and he started reading the new Testament and he would start in the books of the gospels. And he literally would read the introduction to it about who it was written towards. And he would be like, see, this is written to the Jews. It's not written for us. And he's like, we don't, we don't need these. Like they're not for us. They're not applicable to us in any way. And so like even during the course of sermons and stuff, they would get to a part of a verse that they believed was not for them, but for the Jews or for the Israelites or the house of Israel. And they'd be like, so this isn't it. They wouldn't even read it. They like wouldn't even read it, that it wasn't applicable to us. They literally basically took Paul's letters and and the book of John. Like they did not, not the book of Hebrews, not the book of James, not like they literally were like, no, this isn't for us. It's for It's for Israel. It's not for us at all. And I remember reading that and sitting there with them. He gave us this book too that he had written, like a 400-page book on the doctrines of dispensationalism. He was like the, the doctrine of dispensation, extreme version, to where those guys were ripping out those chapters, those books of the Bible. They're like, we had, this has no bearing for us. It was at the same time I was also learning the beautiful fruit that comes from having a hunger to read the entirety of the word. Like I was like studying Genesis six and all of these different things about our creation. And I was like, the Bible is amazing. You guys, like, how could you ever think that there's not wonderful treasures waiting on every single page? It was just, it could not have been more contrasting to somebody that was well-rounded in an understanding of the entirety of our scriptures versus somebody that was the cherry picker. They were just as guilty of cherry picking scriptures out of context to build their doctrine as, as the house of flat irons was. And I was like, this is devastating. My wife and I were like, we can't be here. This is awful. But on the other side of it, the one thing that we did get, the good fruit that we got to see and experience from those people was this love for their children and, and trying their absolute utmost to raise their children up as much as they could with them alongside them. And so children were like intimately close to them as a part of the church. They weren't sent off to children's school. They weren't, they weren't compartmentalized. Many churches do the very same thing as schools do is they have programs and compartmentalization where children are, are shoved off into these other corners, which is where so much of the sexual perversion takes place because predators love to lurk in children's ministries. That's their favorite place to work. That's why they're in your schools so much. That's why they are there. They look like the sheep and the shepherds. And reality is they're the savage wolves. And if you have your children with the parents, like it's designed to be, instead of divorcing them every single Sunday and dropping them off in the coffers of chaos, hey, this perversions, these perverts don't have the ability to prosper. But as soon as your church gets too big to not be basically contained in a house, you should multiply and spread out. It's like, we, we don't do fellowships like churches of any kind, like just going to be real honest. We saw we, everywhere we've gone, except for just maybe one that was in a single room fellowship. That was it. We love you guys. Everywhere else, there was just rampant, disgusting perversion, just, just below the surface that was being covered up by leadership on a regular occasion. It was just brutal, you know, and we've seen this consistently, but this is why you see in the, the, Book of Acts, they broke bread one another and ate in each other's houses. That's how the church multiplies, the ecclesia. You know what I'm saying? You guys, like the ecclesia, right? The, the church started at Sinai, by the way. It didn't start in the book of Acts. That's not when the church started. It literally started in Sinai. The Gahal is what it's called. Anyways, just something to consider, you guys. But it was just a huge contrast in my life because I felt like somebody throughout my life had given me a single-edged sword and told me to fight all my battles. Like I fought with machetes that were single-edged. But it's like most believers are just single-edged, ready to fight, and they're going to lose every day because you can't cut 
four times better with a double edge, you guys. So check this out. Let's get here for a second. This is Dr. Michael Lake's book. You ready for this? Chapter one, introduction to the tabernacle and the fire of Elohim. Seeing the word of Elohim through Hebraic eyes. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the Torah of Yahuwah. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. As I was considering the concepts that I wanted to develop in this chapter, my mind wandered back to a scene from my first grade reading class. We were being introduced to the wonderful world of reading through the exploits of Dick and Jane. <laughs> read my chapter. If you guys listen to my video on why you can't read, this is exactly the thing that's highlighted as like the, the culmination of the agenda for whole world, whole word reading as opposed to phonics based reading and why you can't read. Why most people cannot read is because they learned through these exact garbage books. He literally goes through the, the origin stories of that. It's hilariously nightmarishly bad. Anyways, just a funny little contradiction right here. Oh, uh, the dick. <laughs> In the 1960s, every child in America was learning to read, was familiar with Dick and Jane. See Dick run or Jane walks home were common sentences young students discovered in the first readers of that era. However, some of the students had difficulty with their reading. Their problem was not in pronouncing the words, but in transitioning from comprehending individual words to understanding what was being presented in the sentences. In a pivotal moment of the discovery, the teacher had us close our eyes and try to imagine what we were reading. I imagine Dick running after a kickball on a playground, similar to the one we had at our elementary school. After a few moments, everyone opened their eyes and you could see the connection between the written word and the conveying meaning of the sentences take hold in each young one's minds. Letters became words, words became sentences, and sentences, when thought about, would paint images within our minds that conveyed knowledge. As I grew, books continued to paint images within my mind. From the relentless captain hunting Moby Dick to men exploring deep space, each book brought new and exciting adventures. Not only was I expanding my vocabulary, but I could see the unfolding of each story in my mind. In fact, as I later was swept up in the storylines, my other senses were activated too. There were times that I could feel the cool breeze or smell the orchard that was being described in the story. However, for a few the connection of the mind's eye and the written page never occurs. There's a rare condition known as aphantasia, aphantasia, which is also known as mind blindness. Wikipedia defines aphantasia as follows. Aphantasia is the suggested name for a condition where one does not possess a functioning mind's eye and cannot visualize imagery. Today, I believe there are many Christians that suffer from a pseudo aphantasia, this phenomenon of pseudo aphantasia occurs in part because of the disenfranchisement of our Hebraic heritage, and this condition is restricted to the word of Elohim. In my opinion, this condition is caused by our departure from training young believers in the ancient practice of meditating on the word of Elohim. Whether this abandonment was caused by some religious attitude regarding the Bible or through mental laziness reinforced by the advent of television, we no longer take the time to look into the Word of God. The result many times is that we are like the children in that first grade reading class so many years ago. We see the words but cannot visualize the meaning they express. Could this explain why so many individuals today read over the words within the Bible but do not fully grasp the powerful truths enfolded in its pages before we proceed in our study? Anyways, I'm going to stop there. As I, as I read through this, like you guys know how I am. I've, I've got such a myriad of books and stu of, of study materials at any given time because the, the form of learning that I, I've, I most enjoy is one that's not confined to someone's check marks and boxes and equations and structure to the same form of structure because my mind makes connections from this book to the underground history of American education and to the gen like my mind bounces around through all of these different resources. And I suddenly start to see the thread, this common thread. And you know what? 
this mental blindness is totally what the doctrines of dispensationalism has created in mankind. It's just like how the schooling system was engineered by industrialists and capitalists, by propagandists, marketing agencies, advertising agencies, by a tyrannical government to try to strip people from biblical literacy. They used to be able to have a, a, a not over 98% literacy rate in the United States that was eradicated from them in America within about 100 years. They'd gotten people to where they can't read. This is why even today there's these huge outcries about people realizing, I guess we've been te- they, they stripped us of the ability to sound out words so that people can't read for themselves. Like my wife struggled with this. We had talked about this a bunch, but it's really important here. This was so well orchestrated and designed because they took from people the ability to understand what they're reading and to be able to pick up something that's beyond their normal reading experience and run with it. Like the day they took a book out of the school child's hands and they put a tablet in its place is the day that the war for the electric dragon like this. This is why like books like the invisible rainbow are so helpful to understand how dangerous and toxic it is when you take a child from book reading to tablet reading, how dangerous it is, have them setting that thing on their lap every day, setting it next to their chest every day. Like the toxicity of what happens in the micro, the mitochondria of the cell and cellular respiration slows down in the presence of electromagnetic field, like wherever they're holding that thing is causing harm. It's slowing down their ability for oxygen to be utilized by the body. So you have, this is why you're going to see the development of so many of these cancers, heart disease, diabetes, exploding ad infinitum as children from an earlier and earlier age are introduced to technology on an, on a nonstop basis. You're going to see an outbreaks and encourage just the continuity of these diseases are going to continue to just skyrocket. And with the advent, you, we start introducing higher and higher concentrations of graphenes and hydrogels and so many of these other components into our bodies, we're going to see a continuity of degradation because we're putting antenna arrays, self-assembly antenna arrays inside our bodies that react with these electromagnetic fields that further exasperate the problem of, of what cellular damage that's taking place in the body. And you know, the difference between that and when you see children who are have a love for books, have a love for physical reading. Like I am a constant advocate for the analog things in life because I've seen the fruitfulness that came when I went and took my Xbox outside and I smashed it. Like I got to see the benefit of my life when I put away video games. That was a huge stronghold for a long time in my life. Like it was, it was introduced to me to groom me to go into the United States military to slaughter and murder people more effectively. Games like Splinter Cell was like my handlers training games for me so that I could learn how to be a more effective assassin. Like it was a, it's an absolutely designed destruction to us. Like these are the doctrines of Balaam that are still working so hard to ruin our children, to ruin our sons and daughters, the young men and the young women from actually being capable warriors, but to yet give them the, the idea that they've experienced it because a lot of people will watch a YouTube video and I can fall guilty to this too and feel like I've done it because I saw somebody else do it. It's like, well, I know how to do that because I saw somebody else do it until you go and try it yourself. That was a rude wake up call when I tried to learn how to do butchering. I'm like trying to butcher a chicken for myself because I watched people on YouTube do it. I was so stressed out. First time I tried to do it was with a 13 year old young man who is doing it with me. I love you, Jeremiah. You're a stinking brave warrior. We are literally trying to figure out how to butcher these chickens on our own and trying to capture the blood and not have it go splaying everywhere. Like it was, it was way harder to do than when you see people who have done thousands of chickens, knock it out in six minutes. And I'm like, it took me an hour to butcher that chicken first time. I thought I was going to be so good at it. And I was like, oh my gosh, here I was preparing to like butcher a hundred of them. I was like, we're going to be professional butchers here on this farm. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be so good at it. We're going to crank one of these things out every few minutes. I was watching a little too much of that YouTube life. You know what I'm saying? But it was so good for me to get the real life experience because there was a costliness to the desire that I had to eat meat. I was like, I want to eat chicken. I want to raise my chickens myself. 
and see what that's like. One of the most valuable things to do. But there was a young man there working on the farm aside me who was learning these experiences at 13 years old. Like why? What a gift. What a gift to learn where real food comes from and to be part of the sweatquity that's required to raise life and to give life. And you know what? The blessing of life that got that was actually imparted to someone like Daniel was that he got to be raised in the righteous path, in the ways of, of purity and of truth. And because of that, he was exon, exalted among the people of the land. Like he gets promoted. As you read the entire book of Daniel, you see these constant moments where Daniel's like, people go after him. They try to destroy him and ruin him. And Daniel rises up, not only better, but like exceedingly more so than everybody else around him. Let's read the book of Baal and the dragon. Check this out. Come on. Let's put to death all that garbage that you guys got raised with and thinking that dragons weren't real. Listen, this dragon is literally like in the archaeological records. The actual dragon Daniel was battling here was on the gates of Ishtar, which are in a museum today. And Oh, people love them. They're like the gates of Ishtar because they love their Easter worship, Sunday pagan garbage, garbage stuff. So Ishtar still got her gates. You know what I'm saying? And people still go bow down and travel all over the world to go worship at her gates. And on there is this hybrid dragon that Daniel fought. History is amazing, you guys. Way cooler than any other garbage that you got raised in. Telling you, son. Telling you. Let's jump into it. Here's another website that I use. I'll show you guys here. This is uh, the Apocrypha. This is sacred-texts.com. I've used as well. Uh, good place to track down some of these books. Anyways, Bell and the Dragon, Chapter 1. And King Astyagus was gathered to his fathers, and Cyrus of Persia received his kingdom. And Daniel conversed with the king and was honored above all his friends. Now the Babylonians had an idol called Bell. And there were spent upon him every day twelve great measures of fine flour and forty sheep and six vessels of wine. And the king worshipped it and went daily to adore it. But Daniel worshipped his own Elohim. And the king said unto him, Why do you not worship Baal? And then who answered and said, Because I may not worship idols made with hands, but the living Elohim who hath created the heaven and the earth and has sovereignty over all flesh. Then said the king unto him, Think you not that Bel is a living Elohim? See now not how much he is eaten and drinks every day? Then Daniel smiled and said, O king, do not be deceived, for this is but clay within and brass without, and never did eat or drink anything. So the king was angry, wroth, and called for his priests and said unto them, If you tell me not who this is that devours these expenses, you shall die. But if you can certify me that Bel devours them, then Daniel shall die, for he has spoken blasphemy against Bel. And Daniel said unto the king, Let it be according to your word. Now the priests of Baal were threescore and ten, besides their wives and children. And the king went with Daniel into the temple of Baal. So Baal's priest said, Lo, we'll go out, but you, O king, set on the meat, and make ready the wine, and shut the door fast, and seal it with your own signet. And tomorrow, when you come in, if you find not that he has eaten it all up, we will suffer death, or else Daniel, that speaks falsely against us. And they little regarded it, for under the table they had made a pretty entrance, whereby they entered in continually and consumed those things. So when they were gone forth, the king set meat before Baal. Now Daniel had commanded his servants to bring ashes, and those they strewed throughout all the temple in the presence of the king alone. Then went they out and shut the door and sealed it with the king's signet, and so departed. Now in the night came the priests with their wives and children, as they were to do, and did eat and drink it all up. In the morning, bed... In the morning time, the king arose and Daniel with him. And the king said, Daniel, are the seals whole? And he said, Yes, O king, they are whole. And as soon as he had opened the door, the king looked upon the table and cried out with a loud voice, Great are you, O Baal, and with thee is in no deceit at all. Then laughed Daniel and held the king that he should not go in and said, Behold now the pavement and mark well whose footsteps are these. And the king said, I see the footsteps of men, women, and children. And the king was angry. And the 
overtook the priests with their wives and children who showed in the private doors where they came in and consumed such things as were upon the table. Therefore the king slew them and delivered Baal into Daniel's power, who destroyed him and his temple. And in that same place, oh, so just real quick here, understand the cunningness of Daniel to expose the Illuminati and the Jesuits all in one go. Do you know what I'm saying? How beautiful this is? It's the black robe priests are finally exposed as the absolute liars, thieves, and scoundrels that they are. He finally re reveals the house of idolatry to be one of vanity and falsehood because fundamentally this is the stuff that needs to get exposed in order for judgment to flow outwards. It's just a beautiful illustration of something you also see similarly play out in the life of Abraham. And when you read it from Jubilees and Jasher, that he not only had showdowns early on in life, like Abraham wasn't just some dude who was who didn't know anything about Yah and had no guarding, no reverence for Yahuwah. It's not like Abraham was a nobody in the ways of keeping the commandments. He was an upright and righteous man. He was a man who was well instructed in the house of Shem. Like he was raised up to understand the ways of, of Yahuwah because from his birth, Nimrod had been absolutely trying to murder him from his birth onward. And when Abraham was hidden away in the desert in a cave, he literally got to go live with the descendants of Noah and Shem, like in the wilderness. He got to be trained up in the ways of Yahuwah, which is why he understood how to carry on the priesthood of Yahuwah. He was a prophet of Yah, and he was able to be like a friend with Elohim. Amazing, amazing man. But when he went back to his father's house, his father was a household idol maker. And so he had a showdown with him. He had an absolute showdown with him and destroyed his father's idols. And he got to demonstrate his zealousness for Yahuwah. I just love it. Anyways, let's jump in here because this is what's just absolutely fantastic. Dragon fighting time. Hallelujah. Pay attention, children. Young men, young women, pay attention. Got to learn how to fight dragons right now. And in that same place, there was a great dragon, which they of Babylon worshipped. And the king said unto Daniel, Will you also say that this is of brass? Lo, he lives, he eats and drinks. How can you not say that he is not a living God? Therefore worship him. Then said Daniel unto the king, I will worship Yahuwah, my Elohim, for he is the living Elohim. But give me leave, O king, and I shall slay this dragon without sword or staff. The king said, I give you leave. Then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and did cook them together and made lumps thereof. This he put in the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst into flames, and said, Daniel, Lo, these are the gods you worship. When they of Babylon heard, they took great indignation and conspired against the king, saying, The king has become a Jew and has destroyed Baal. He has slain the dragon and put the priest to death. So they came to the king and said, Deliver us, Daniel, or we will destroy you in your house. Now when the king saw that they pressed him sorely, being constrained, he delivered Daniel unto them, who cast him into the lion's den where he was for six days. And in the den there were seven lions, and they'd given to them every day two carcasses and two sheep, which were then not given to them, to the intent that they might devour Daniel. Now there was in Jewry a prophet called Habakkuk, who made pottage and had broken bread in a bowl and was going into the field for to bring it to the reapers. But the angel of Yahuwah said unto Habakkuk, Go, carry the dinner that you have into Babylon unto Daniel, who is in the lion's den. And Habakkuk said, Yahuwah, I have never seen Babylon, neither do I know where the den is. Then the angel of Yahuwah took him by the crown and bare him by the hair of his head and through the vehemency of his spirit set him in Babylon over the den. And Habakkuk cried, saying, O oh, Daniel, Daniel, take the dinner which Elohim has sent thee. And Daniel said, Oh, you have remembered me, O Elohim. Neither have you forsaken them that seek you and love you. So Daniel arose and ate, and the angel of Yahuwah set Habakkuk in his own place again immediately. Upon the seventh day the king went to bewail Daniel. And when he came to the den, he looked in, and behold, Daniel was sitting. Then the king cried with a loud voice, saying, Great are you, Yahuwah Elohim of Daniel. There is none beside you. 
And he drew him out and cast those that were the cause of his destruction into the den. And they were devoured in a moment before his face. That, you guys, is how you fight a dragon. Pitch, fat, and hair. Shove it down into their little bellies, into their mouths. It'll When they go to try to burn you with their fire that comes out of their mouths, they get burned instead, you know? These are real beings, like actual creatures. And these are like literal lessons on how to fight them. Tuck that away. You guys might literally be the generation that's fighting dragons next. They live in the cracks of the rocks, you guys. That's what's in the deep underground military bases. That's what's actually down there. People are like, it's reptilians. I'm like, it's dragons. Dragons, not reptilians. They're dragons. They're dragon people. Seriously, they've been around a long time. Sons of Balaam. Like, don't mess around. You get into too much sorcery, guys, you get turned into a dragon. It's not good. Same with lycanthropy. It's what a lot of these dogmen and werewolf sightings you guys are talking about would have come from. It's all stuff, real stuff, you guys. Got to deal with it. And this is the way Daniel did it. He had wisdom from Yahuwah. Do you understand? This is what, like, the beautiful stories that we see in the scriptures is when people have the spirit of Elohim upon them. They have boldness. And you know what? They also have zealousness for the ways of Yahuwah and guarding the righteous paths of Yahuwah. Like, they hate idolatry fundamentally. And this should be one of those defining characteristics. Like if you want to be a believer of these scriptures, you're going to find from Genesis all the way to the very end of Revelation, Yahuwah hates idolatry. He hates it. And you know what? You were raised in a world that conditioned you to be blind to it so that you would literally be aphantasia, that you would have this blindness to when you see it all around you, that you actually can't see it in your eyes as idolatry. But it is. It's designed to be so. It's designed to abominate you and destroy you. These are like the realities of the system that we are born into. And you know what? We are being raised in a society that's under the influence of the great red dragon. This is truly what we are seeing, the fruits of his kingdom hanging on the tree so that, you know what, it's laid bare. And I pray for you guys to have the discernment to see and recognize these things as they come across and to have the zealousness to drive them out of your life. And you know what, we pray for Yahuwah to give us opportunities to drive them out of our communities, out of our cities and our states and out of our countries so that we can see the righteous remnant shine again. That we can be exemplary. And you know what? Then people can once more call out and say, great is the Elohim of this people. Great is the mighty one that's over these people. There is none like him. You know what? These should be the declaration that comes from kings and prime ministers and priests when they interact with the righteous remnant of Yahuwah. We are supposed to be the people that are glorifying and magnifying our creator to such an extent that the world gets turned upside down. And you know what? The problem is that we got raised in a culture that watered us down until we looked just like the rest of them. But we were made to be set apart. We're not made to look like them, to act like them, to think like them, to eat like them, to drink like them. We we're made to be a set apart people, like a royal priesthood. This was his desire, his, his intention for us from the beginning. And you know what? As we raise our sons up in this path, as we raise our daughters up in this path, we really will get to shine like the stars in the firmament. It's going to be one of the most beautiful things to get to see generations that are raised up in a path of righteousness. I pray you guys have an absolutely marvelous day. Thank you for all of your steadfast encouragement, your incredible generosity towards me and my family and our ministry. Thank you for your love and your support. We love you guys so much, and I really look forward to talking to you again soon. I love you guys.